All right. Welcome, everyone, to the American Cetacean Society, San Francisco Bay Chapters, March 2024 speaker event. And I'm Susan Hopp, board member responsible for our speaker program. And with me is fellow board member Wade Cobb. Uh, first, for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, we are a chapter within a national organization that is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and awarding grants towards cetacean research. We appreciate your donations in support of our mission the donations fund our research grants to scientists and expenses uh, for these talks. And it's really easy to donate on our website if you haven't at time of registration. So again, thank you so much. Um, another very exciting item to announce. We are um, indeed excited to announce the resumption of our naturalist class. Uh, we were doing it regularly and then COVID kind of got in the way as we all know. But um, over the course of uh, six weekly sessions, participants will learn the basics and more about cetaceans and their marine habitat. Um, registration will begin soon. Sessions are starting on May 2nd, and they, there's six Thursdays ending on June 6th. And uh, it's just in time for prime cetacean viewing season. So. I'll just say my, I am, am a graduate of our naturalist class about um, nine years ago now. And all I can say, um, all that I learned really changed my life. So please uh, be on the lookout for more information and, and registration uh, details. So tonight, all right, we are recording this session and uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. That, that actually be is better than the chat. Um, and after the presentation, we'll do our best uh, to get to them. But for tonight, um, we are truly going deep tonight into our oceans to uncover some secrets below. You know, our amazing planet is, I looked it up, 70.8% ocean, yet how little of it we really know. Tonight's speaker is Susan Casey, author of The Underworld, Journeys to the Depths of the Ocean. She will take us with her during seven years embedded with explorers and marine scientists to uncover life and unravel mysteries of the deep, deep, at the same time giving us an understanding of how essential the undersea world is to a thriving life above. Underworld is Susan's fourth New York Times bestseller and joins Voices in the Ocean, A Journey into the Wild and Haunting World of Dolphins, The Wave, In Pursuit of the Rogues, Freaks, and Giants of the Ocean, and The Devil's Teeth, A Story of Survival Among America's Great, great White Sharks. Uh, Susan is the former editor-in-chief of O, the Oprah Magazine, and also served as the development editor for Time, Inc., Editor-in-Chief of Sports Illustrated Women, Editor-at-Large for Time, Inc., and Creative Director of Outside Magazine. She is a National Ma Magazine award-winning journalist whose work has been featured in The Best American Science and Nature Writing, The Best American Magazine Writing Anthologies, and has appeared in Vanity Fair, Esquire, Sports Illustrated, Fortune, Time, Outside, and National Geographic. Susan, we are really honored to have you here. So thank you, and uh, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Susan. It's really a pleasure to talk to you all, and uh, I'm sure you've noticed a little bit of a theme in my work. I'm an ocean obsessive, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Uh, I just, um, I, I don't think I will ever encounter another subject matter that intrigues me uh, as much as the ocean. And uh, I don't think also that I will ever run out of stories that I want to tell about it. But in particular, tonight, I want to talk about the deep ocean, uh, which is a subject I had been wanting to write about ever since I started writing about the ocean, but was always quite daunted by it. I mean, and there's there are numerous reasons why. But um, before I launch into it, I think I should probably explain what is the deep ocean? So 
it's obviously a vast amount of the ocean. Uh, if you think, Susan mentioned that the the Earth is 70.8% uh, 70 .70 uh, ocean, which you hear that a lot. So the ocean covers that percentage of the globe, but I prefer to think of the uh, a different statistic, which is uh, if you think of the Earth as a three-dimensional living space, as a, as a biosphere, 95% of that is ocean. And sorry, excuse me, 98% of that is ocean and 95% of it is deep ocean. And by deep ocean, uh, what is typically referred to is the waters below 600 feet, so 200 meters. And uh, we don't just live on an ocean planet, we live on a deep ocean planet. And yet it's the realm that we know the least about. So um, before I uh, start talking, I wanna just play you a quick video about the underworld that will give you a sense of the journey we're gonna take. And I always have the, the same challenge every time I'm talking about this book is just that there is so much to say about the deep ocean. Um, it's just hard to get it into an hour or 15 minutes, but this should give you a sense of the journey that we're gonna take tonight. Why isn't it playing? Maybe try it one more time. Let me try it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. For as long as I can remember, I've been drawn to the ocean. And I've always wondered what's down there? Because everything that we see is just the surface. Below the surface, there's a parallel universe. Who could anybody not be curious? So I spent five years descending into the depths myself to come back with the stories that I found there. There are millions of species we've never seen before. There are three million undiscovered shipwrecks. There's endless lost knowledge endless future knowledge, endless things to be curious about. It's sublime. So it's a kind of, people think of the ocean, uh, the deep ocean as being sort of dark and spooky and scary, um, but I don't think anybody is expecting its, its beauty. Um, and that's something that I really wanna talk about and show you some pictures about tonight you hear all the time, the, the, it's almost like a cliche when people say, well, we know more about the moon than we know about the, about the bottom of the sea, the, about the seafloor. And um, all the deep sea scientists I know get kind of mad when they hear that, because it's not that we don't know a lot about the deep ocean. We've really advanced in our knowledge, particularly lately, um, and as technology advances as well, it's just that there is just so much more that we have to learn um, because, the probably one of the most no, notable attributes of, of the deep is just its immensity. And I think it's very hard for us to wrap our heads around it because anytime you look at the ocean uh, or you do anything in the ocean or you study it, we there's just one inescapable truth and that's that we're kind of floating around the ceiling of it. So um, we we do know a lot about it. It's just that there's, it's just epic in terms of, of how much is going on down there. Um, and we've come a long way in a really short time. So I want to sort of um, zoom back in time to 1539. And this is a, 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 in a small part, about a, um, one third of a map called the Carta Marina that was drawn in uh, by a Swedish uh, priest and historian named Olus Magnus. And I had uh, been looking at these maps uh, to sort of chart back in history how humanity interacted, perceived the deep ocean. So to me, the Carta Marina was just this uh, wonderful example of what it must have been like in the 16th century to be a person who lived at, say, in Scandinavia, because this is the, the map is of Scandinavia, and looking out at the ocean and wondering where does it end? What's on the bottom? How deep is it? Who lives there? And Olus Magnus was, he worked for the Catholic church. And so he was pretty well traveled and he sort of went around and 
uh, assembled all this information, not only from people who uh, were coastal dwellers in Scandinavia, but also um, historical and classical references to the deep ocean from Aristotle, from Pliny the Elder, um, and really what the sort of prevailing thought was, was that anywhere offshore was just completely lousy with monsters. There were monsters everywhere. And uh, you can see that Olus Magnus in great detail. I mean, when you see this map, it takes up, it's it's about 23 feet square and it's uh, there's only two copies of it in existence. And I went to see the one that's in Uppsala, Sweden. Um, and it just kind of blows your mind at how detailed he was. He really was trying to figure out uh, exactly how to represent these creatures and and this environment. And I this is the American Cetacean Society. So I want to point out to you that a lot of the creatures were sort of um, a medieval telephone game of, of, of sightings of whales. And it's kind of understandable uh, when you think of what it must be like to be, say, a medieval farmer who maybe sees a stranded sperm whale on the beach and has no context or knowledge of understanding what the this animal is and it's 50 feet long and it has seven inch teeth and of course it's a monster. So, but there's a certain sort of, Olaus Magnus also took a great, they had a great deal of affection for these creatures and wrote really voluminously about them um, and with great authority as well. And uh, you can see there are some that are um, clearly Based on, you can see that they're 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 spouting, and um, you know there's uh, there's a lot going on with these these giant animals. But that when you see the maps, the ancient maps, and they say here be monsters or here be dragons, that's sort of what he was trying to move the ball down the field. Okay, here what monsters, what dragons, um, and it was for a long time a complete tabula rasa, but. I think there was quite a lot of fear around it because obviously people would set sail in ships and sometimes never come back and nobody would have any idea what had happened. And it was centuries actually that there were all kinds of zany hypotheses about what was going on offshore in the deep waters, in the here be dragons part of the ocean. And it wasn't until 1873 that the first deep sea expedition happened which was called the Challenger Expedition and it really changed. It was sort of a before and after type of expedition, British expedition that left and basically circumnavigated the world for three and a half years, uh, dredging the seafloor and dredging at depths in the open ocean to see what lived there. Because the question was still the same, what's down there? Um, and prior to the Challenger expedition in the sort of earlier part of the 19th century, a very influential naturalist named Edward Forbes from the University of Edinburgh had basically put forth this theory called the Azoic theory. And Forbes, based on a trip that he had made in the Mediterranean, which uh, he happened to have been in a place that was a little bit more of a deserty and deep ocean environment. So he didn't catch very much in his dredge. And he sort of echoed the perception uh, that a lot of people had of the deep, which is it's so scary. It's so um, hostile to life. It's so inaccessible to us. and unamenable to us humans, that surely nothing else could live there. So the Azoic theory basically meant without life. Um, his contention was nothing lives at the bottom of the ocean. Um, there were other thoughts as well. One was that the pressures of the deep ocean would be so intense that the seafloor would have had to be compacted um, so densely that it was like cement. And there was another, the French um, naturalist who believed that it must be so cold down there that maybe the seafloor was sealed with a layer of ice. And so of course nothing could penetrate that. And there was also a thought that uh, because the pressures would increase as we go deeper, at a certain point, the water would be so dense that nothing could sink through it. So depending on an object's weight and ships and lost, bodies and dead animals and everything would all be sort of floating somewhere in the midwater and absolutely nothing was heavy enough to hit the seafloor. So this is sort of what's swirling around is all these thoughts. Maybe there's, it's like a galaxy of lost things floating around down there, or maybe there's, you know, ice, <laughs> nobody knew. 
Um, so the Challenger expedition was really important because they went everywhere. Um, and it was really a great historical thing because so many of the scientists uh, wrote books and journals, and they, of course, uh, made an immense contribution to our understanding of the deep ocean. Uh, uh, but we still didn't know, you know, we still had, nobody had ever seen it. They um, had made, they would drop lines to try to figure out the depth of the ocean. And they did manage to drop a line into some very deep crevices, uh, including the Mariana Trench. They got um, down, they figured that the Mariana Trench was about 22,000 feet deep, although of course they didn't know it was the Mariana Trench. Um, they, you know, it's it's actually uh, almost 36,000 feet deep in its deepest point, but still what they figured out was there are some very, very deep areas in the ocean and nothing about it is homogenous. Um, they did find animals at absolutely every depth. They brought up all these creatures that nobody had ever seen before. Um, some of them were twinkling and glowing. Uh, they really, they, they created a 50 volume report afterwards that um, opened up everybody's eyes to just like how much was going on uh, in the deep ocean. And right when they pulled back into England at the end in, in 1876, um, Jules Verne came out with his novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So there was a little bit of a, a, a sort of a rage for the deep ocean right around that time. And, um, but of course, Jules Verne was using his imagination and the Challenger scientists were working with a very small piece of the puzzle. Nobody had seen the deep ocean and it didn't seem likely that we would be going down there anytime soon. So it was another 50 years, like, I guess that's pretty soon in, in uh, historical time. But in 1930, this is a, a slide of two men, um, William Beebe and Otis Barton, and they were the first men to go into the deep ocean and they went to the uppermost layer which is called the twilight zone. And that goes from 600 feet down to 3,300 feet. And uh, they designed this uh, craft that you can see here, which was called the bathysphere. And really what it was, was a hollow steel sphere, five feet in diameter with uh, three holes for viewports. And um, the viewports themselves were made of fused quartz. So um, kind of dicey. The reason why they didn't end up with three viewports, even though they had three viewport holes cut into their sphere, was that um, in pressure testing, in, in a, I might add a relatively gentle pressure testing, three of the five uh, viewports cracked. Um, so they only had two that remained. And that I think was always one of the, when you think of the pressures, even at say a thousand feet, the idea that the viewport could blow out is was probably one of the most terrifying things about this um, excursion. But the other thing was that it was, this bathysphere was, you know, weighed tons. It was hanging from a crane uh, on a line, like imagine a Christmas tree ornament uh, with two men in it down 3000 feet. And if anything had happened to that line, if, um, if it had, if it, the winch had gotten stuck, or if the line had released from the bathysphere, they're a cannonball. They're going to the bottom of the seafloor. And, um, you know, this is just, now the subs uh, have so many various things that, that this would this kind of risk is is just completely wild to think about now. The, the, the sphere is still the same because that is the shape that uh, distributes the pressures equally, and that is critical in the deep ocean. Uh, but there's all this syntactic foam around it, so it can become neutrally buoyant. It can float to the surface on its own. Of course, in 1930, there was none of that. And so these two guys crawled in there and became the first humans to witness the deep ocean um, offshore from Bermuda. And BB, I should add, is a little bit of a celebrity. He was a really popular uh, writer and natural history writer. And he was a curator at the Bronx Zoo, which was new back in those days. And he was just kind of a swashbuckling guy, celebrity around Manhattan, pretty much a, kind of a ladies man. Barton was an engineering student who had uh, a trust fund and really wanted to be part of the uh, opening up of the deep ocean. But BB had the celebrity and Barton had the money. And other than that, the partnership was a little awkward. They didn't really like each other, um, but they did manage to make many dives. And what they, the, the twilight zone is an amazing part of, of the ocean. It, I call it the Manhattan of the deep because there are more marine creatures in this 
600 feet to 3,300 feet layer of the ocean than there are in all the other regions of the ocean combined. And about 80% of the animals that live there use bioluminescence. Uh, so they have the ability to light themselves up um, in all kinds of different ways. And that's really unusual on land. There's only a handful of animals that uh, mostly insects, some fungi, um, some worms, obviously fireflies. Uh, use bioluminescence, but in the deep ocean, it's a major survival strategy. It's how they hunt, how they mate. It's it's how to disguise yourself. It's how to illuminate yourself uh, to do all kinds of things that they need to do to survive. And everybody, uh, we always see these pictures in the twilight zone of, of these fish with the giant teeth that look so like straight from nightmare central casting. But most of these fish are like tiny. And this is an example of one. Uh, this slide is a viper fish. And as you can see, his teeth are so large, they're kind of wrapping around his head and they're translucent. They don't reflect light. So um, this little tiny fish, which is probably about six inches long, and you can see all the bioluminescent organs on the body. These, these organs illuminate. And you can see them by the mouth there. And you can see around the eye, the, you know, giant eye to be able to pick up any traces of bioluminescence within that realm. Um, I, you know, if you don't come across food very often, you make sense to have some jail bars on the front of your mouth. So um, this is just an example of these fantastic adaptations that uh, these animals have once you start going deeper. This beautiful little fish is called the elongated bristlemouth. And when I uh, do a presentation in person, I always ask the audience, to raise their hand and tell me how many people have ever heard of an elongated bristlemouth. And usually if there's anybody, it's a marine scientist, but most people haven't. And what's so uh, fantastical about that is that this little fish, this elongated bristlemouth is the most abundant vertebrate on earth, scientists believe. There are trillions and possibly even quadrillions of them. Um, an estimate, one estimate that I discovered was uh, about a hundred thousand bristle mouse for every one of us. And so it's an incredible thing that none of us have ever seen one in person or maybe hadn't even heard of it. Uh, and also in the twilight zone, we have the majority of the world's jellyfish species and jellies of course are just magnificently beautiful and very ancient creatures like 500 million years old. And although they're always described as simple, simple creatures, they have all kinds of survival strategies and abilities that you only get when you hang around for 500 million years successfully in an environment. And this another strategy for staying hidden or um, otherwise blending into the background in the deep ocean is to be transparent. So you see lots of transparent bodies. This is a glass squid. Um, and you can also see the photophores, the light producing organs around this squid. And this is one of uh, the most colorful characters in the Twilight Zone. This is a photo uh, that uh, is, is quite well known. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, uh, took this photograph in, um, in Monterey Bay. And this is the barrel eye fish. And what's so amazing about the barrel eye is that you probably looking at this uh, and thinking those two, those two eyes, like things on the front with the little kissy lips there are the eyes and the mouth. Well, the eyes are those two green egg yolks kind of inside the head. So the barrel eyes head is transparent and those green eyes are staring straight out of the top of his own head and they're completely encased in this trans uh, transparent head. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. This fish possibly hunts siph siphonophores and other jellies with stinging tentacles. Um, and those eyes that are sealed inside the head can rotate. So the fish is looking forward. You can also look straight up as he's doing now. But what's funny about it is that um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium scientists were finding um, barrel eyes, but when they bring them up in the nets, and uh, as the challenger scientists also knew that a lot of these animals kind of deflate, like particularly if they're gelatinous, which there's a lot of gelatinous action going on in the deep ocean. You know, when they come up in a net, they sort of deflate. They don't really know what they look like and they certainly haven't got a sense of their behavior until they're down there with uh, cameras and ROVs and human occupied submersibles that, that we have now. Um, but this is it was a real revelation to see how this fish was actually operating as opposed to just seeing a bunch of jello in the net. Um, 
So the, the very first dive that I did as well into the deep ocean was into the twilight zone. And I uh, went down in a submersible that I, I took this video and the submersible that's in the video is um, a mirror. In, there were two identical su subs. Um, and as you can see, they, these two subs belong to Ocean X, which is a marine research and sort of media organization, nonprofit that takes scientists down um, so they can witness the deep in person and takes uh, a lot of film crews down because they have these two subs with transparent pressure hulls, which are really great for filming. It's like you're floating in a transparent bubble. So again, here we are in a sub where we, we need a sphere, but when you're only going to 3,300 feet, they have figured out a way to make the sphere out of transparent acrylic. Much deeper than that, any deeper than say 6,000 feet, you really start getting into the realm of titanium and steel alloy, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But being able to see the twilight zone in a transparent pressure hull is really cool. And um, I just want to play this little tiny video clip to, um, to uh, show you a little bit of what it was like on the bottom. And I don't know what I was expecting, but it really wasn't this. So as you can see, we landed on limestone silt, and this is off the coast of the Bahamas. Um, and and when you're, it's just a tiny little clip here. Based on that hard side, they. So the reason why it looks like a swimming pool down there is and this was really surprising to me i i guess i kind of expected to see ooze brown ooze beige ooze i'd read a lot about ooze um when we got down there and it was like white sands national park lit up like caribbean swimming pool i i the reason i was i was surprised it's just the once again the beauty is just so breathtaking but the reason is because the, as anybody who scuba dives knows that when you start going down, you lose the colors on the wave, you lose the spectrum. So the first color you lose is red and then orange and then yellow, then green, um, blue and violet uh, at the very end. Well, by the time you're at about 500 feet depth, you're pretty much in darkness. But you're the, the thing that's interesting is we're in darkness because our eyes can't perceive that there are, there's still blue wavelength in the water. Um, so here we are down here at 3,300 feet. And when we turned on our lights, in other words, when we added light to the environment, what we're seeing is the pure blue wavelength. That's all that remains. And this um, sort of blue, when it, when there's no other colors with it, is has a really interesting effect on, on your emotions. Um, I don't know how to describe it. I tried really hard in the book to describe it. Um, it's more like an emotion than a color. It's just very vibrant. Uh, and William Beebe, who was a really a beautiful writer, a real poetic writer, described it uh, how as basically just being sort of this, um, this absolute narcotic trip. And it was, uh, he said, it excited our optic nerves in the most confusing manner. And that's a little bit how I felt. And everybody really just kind of goes into a bit of a reverie when you start seeing this blue. And this gives you a sense of it on the way down, but it's all the way down to after around 3,300 feet, the blue does eventually ebb. And when you're in the, in the deeper, um, the, the, at, in, at deeper depth with a sub, you, you know, it has very powerful lights and you can light it up, up different colors. And you can see animals that are red that appear as black. But this blue, you can see it as you're descending, and this it will give you a sense of it, sort of that this twilight area. Um, and before I go to the next slide, I want to explain what it is. So we were in these two subs going down side by side, and um, we tooled around across this white Sahara for a while, looking at all kinds of cool stuff. And I was just in kind of a euphoric state. Eventually, of course, we did have to go back up. And um, on the way back up, uh, there's three people in each sub and the pilot said to us, okay, turn off. We're going to turn, both subs are going to turn off every light and we're even going to put towels over the, um, the control panel. So there's zero light. And uh, I want you to shut your eyes and I'm going to count to three. And so we're hovering there in the mid water, completely dark. And he, we shut our eyes and he counts to three and on two, both subs flash their lights on, on and off extremely fast. And on three, and this is a, a poor representation of it, but it's <laughs> all the creatures flashed back. And 
what it, it, it's very hard to capture. Um, this it was taken by a BBC cameraman one time, but it doesn't do it justice because really what you're perceiving is more energy than form. But what really blew my mind was that you cannot have this encounter and see it as anything other than a type of communion. We flash, they flash back. We live our lives above the surface, never even thinking about them. And they're always down there. And we can somehow have some sort of communication with them. And if you think about how enormous the ocean is and how much of it is deep ocean, the signaling with light has got to be the most common form of communication on earth. So that is a real eye opener and a privilege to witness. Um, but of course, there's all kinds of other things. You go deeper, you find the big, some of the largest geological features on earth. This is a, a really unique hydrothermal vent field uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean called Lost City, which really captivated me. And that's, of course, why I put it on the cover of my book. Um, it's extremely unique. There's no other place in the world like it. And, and you can see in the foreground here, uh, what's great about this picture is um, it was lit for a movie uh, documentary and it has very unusually um, a sub in the foreground, which is the Alvin, uh, the US Navy's research sub, which is run by Woods Hole. And the Alvin is a fairly big craft, um, but you get a sense of how big this tower here, it's about 200 feet tall. And the scientists that discovered it named it Lost City after the Lost City of Atlantis because it has these towering white carbonate vents and um, all kinds of crazy transparent tiny animals and a, a chemistry that is so unique and a microbiological um, environment that is so unique that microbiologists from all around the world and even astrobiologists uh, have flocked to this, this vent field, Lost City, to be able to understand it more because, um, well, first of all, about 75% of Earth's volcanism happens in the deep ocean. It happens, um, uh, all the tectonic plates meet and pull apart down there, most of them, like all of them. Uh, and so there is a 40,000 mile seam on the earth where the tectonic plates are pulling apart that is volcanic and it's always coming up and building new, new seafloor. So you would think as scientists did 50 years ago when they figured out that this was happening, okay, well, this, if we're constantly getting new seafloor as the plates pull apart, is the earth expanding like a balloon? Well, no, because on the other side of the plate, the two plates are colliding. And when tectonic plates collide, there is just terrific force. And over time, one plate is driven beneath another and goes down into the mantle where it's melted and sort of the whole cycle starts again. So the planet is in perfect equilibrium as it's expanding and they call it subducting. Um, and in these subduction zones, you see what's happening to my hands. When the plates collide, you get these deep trenches. Um, the, these are the hadal trenches, the deepest part of the ocean. We're gonna we're gonna get there on our journey, but I just want to point that out now. Um, so these volcanic vents that are happening um, on the seafloor are really um, fantastically interesting to scientists because obviously they're um, they're really geologically important, but that's not all that's happening there. There's all this biology and microbiology. Um, and it, the, the volcanic vents were only really discovered in 1977 by scientists in the Alvin, this sub here uh, that's on the screen. And the most astonishing part of the whole uh, discovery was that they're covered in animals. And these animals, they, the scientists that found them were a bunch of geologists that were kind of expecting to find hot water emitting from the seafloor, but did not expect to find this entirely different ecosystem that has nothing to do with the sunlight. So these animals were actually, um, obviously they never see the sunlight. They were subsisting on the chemicals and uh, chemical reactions and thermal energy coming from the interior of the earth, as opposed to the energy coming from the sun and creating photosynthesis. This was a different way of looking at life. It was an expansion of our idea of life these creatures were surviving on chemicals. They were, they were surviving it's on chemosynthesis. So there were all these symbiotic relationships between these strange animals and microbes that live within their bodies. There were toxic chemicals like um, hydrogen sulfide coming out of there that they were eating. Um, this was a whole new way of looking at what kind of what life could do. Life had way more tricks up its sleeve than we even imagined. 
Um, so back to that, I want to come. So the Lost City is is in the midnight zone of the ocean. So beneath the twilight zone is the midnight zone, uh, which is from one thousand meters to three thousand meters. And I mean, keep in mind that there are lots of different ways to um, delineate these vast midwaters, but I chose the uh, the names and the measurements that are most commonly used in science. Um, the midnight zone or the bathypelagic zone is um, another huge uh, environment just filled with bioluminescent animals, but you find a, some larger animals there, not just the teeny tiny fish. Um, you find that's where the giants, the haunt of the giant squid, sperm whales can dive that deep, uh, which is amazing. Beak whales can dive below 10,000 feet, below 3,000 meters. Um, so there are some cetaceans that can make it down there, surprisingly enough. And below the midnight zone is the abyssal zone from 3,000 meters to about 6,000 meters. So from about 10,000 feet to about 20,000 feet. And the abyss is, the abyssal zone, also known as the abyss, is uh, one of the is the largest ecosystem on Earth, just massive. Um, I mean, 54% of the planet's surface is covered in in um, a, a waters that deep. Um, and where the abyssal plains meet the seafloor, you get all kinds of um, really subtle and uh, diverse life. Uh, giant spider crabs with like seven foot long legs. Um, lots of giantism, gigantism in the abyss, but also lots of tiny creatures. So really unique and in just immense area. Um, and then of course, that's not the bottom of the ocean, 20,000 feet. The deepest part of the ocean are these Hadal environments that I mentioned and the it, known as the Hadal zone after Hades, the Lord of the underworld and the kingdom of the underworld. Um, and these trenches are, can, can go from 20,000 feet all the way to almost 36,000 feet. And as mentioned before, the one that most people have heard of is the Mariana Trench, uh, which is where also the deepest spot in the Earth's ocean uh, is. It's called the Challenger Deep, and it's approximately 35,876 feet deep. It's very hard to get an exact measurement through seven miles of water, but that's our best estimate to date, and it's a good one. Um, these 10,000 meter trenches, the Mariana Trench, to give you a sense, if you think of the Himalayas turned upside down, it's 44 miles wide and 1500 miles long. So it's it's a very extreme environment. Um, and so in 1960, you would think that we would know a lot about this. It's, it's here on, on the earth. It's, you know, the Mariana Trench is deeper than Everest is high, but thousands of people have been at Everest. But as of 2019, only three people had been to the bottom of, had been to the Challenger Deep. Um, two expeditions, one in 1960 with Don Walsh and Jacques Picard, which was just incredible. They went down in this huge uh, uh, sub called a bathyscaphe, which was like a sphere dangling from what looked like a Goodyear blimp. And they made it to the bottom and they came back up and they saw something long and flat swimming away on the bottom. They had a tiny little viewport, um, just an extraordinary discovery. They, they proved that uh, there were... Obviously, there were things swimming around down there. And um, I had the great good fortune to get to know Don Wall. She passed away uh, last November, but he was, during my reporting for this book, was a real mentor to me and a friend. Uh, and I got to talk to him extensively about this dive, which was, this I share in the book. But he said on the way back up, he and Jacques Picard were talking about, well, surely there's going to be all kinds of people down here. Like, when do you think the next people are going to come like they thought maybe two years well it was 52 years nobody went back to the challenger deep until 2012 when the film director and ocean explorer james cameron went down in his one person sub that he built himself and returned to the challenger deep with don waiting on the ship to congratulate him um and james cameron's sub was uh kind of an experimental sub and um obviously it was the state of the art in 2012, but had all kinds of mechanical problems on the bottom. Um, one person who was on the expedition told me that it, the sub was self-destructing on the bottom and that sub never dived again after that. So it was kind of a one and done type thing. And what the grail sort of was, 
was for there to be a sub that we could go anywhere in the ocean with. It could take people to the challenge of deep, it could go anywhere and it could do it repeatedly and safely. And there were some real engineering challenges that made that really difficult to, to pull off. But in 2018 and 2019, this happened. And um, I always say that one of the reasons I love to write nonfiction is because I, I get to see such extraordinary things. I'm not sure I have enough imagination to even make them up. But in this case, the other thing about nonfiction, the sort of the double-edged sword is that you never know what's gonna happen. And you can get into a situation where maybe uh, some reporting that you need, you have to wait years for it to happen. Well, in terms of timing, I got lucky. I got really lucky um, while I was writing The Underworld because I ended up connecting and joining an expedition called The Five Deeps that uh, happened in 2019. And it involved this submersible that is um, shown on the slide here. And this is the first human occupied, holds two people, full ocean depth, fully certified and accredited submersible. And it was commissioned by a private uh, individual, a businessman from Texas named Victor Vescovo, who was just an epic adventurer. Victor had already been to the top of every, the so highest peaks on each continent and skied to the North and South Poles and started looking around and thought, what can I do next? Um, and was really astonished to, to learn that nobody had explored these Hadal trenches. And keep in mind, there are about 37 of them. Um, the, the Mariana Trench is just one of them. So he was, uh, he went out and Victor is a very smart guy and very successful guy and commissioned a company called Triton Submarines based in Florida uh, to, to develop a prototype and then a plan and then an actual sub for a, a sub that could take him to the Hadal zone repeatedly. It could take him and a scientist to the Hadal zone repeatedly, could basically change the game and open up the Hadal zone for, for human witnessing and open up the science because he also uh, created um, full ocean depth landers, which are these scientific instruments that look kind of like smart cars. They're like big boxy things, but they have instruments all over them. They have video cameras all over them. And Triton, uh, which I call the apple of submersible design because they're just that kind of excellence and that kind of thought into the design and the safety, um, managed to do this and it, I honestly believe that when the history of deep sea exploration is written, that for the Hadal zone, it's really before five deeps and after five deeps. Um, so being on this expedition gave me a front row seat to this. And it was um, the thing that Victor did that was the best of all was he took all the top Hadal scientists with him and he dived with them in the sub and they were just the, the scientific, um, output from this expedition, even though it was a private expedition, not institutional or government led or anything like that, was just like off the charts. And they had really high definition cameras all over these landers. Um, and so uh, they got all kinds of video. I mean, it, half the stuff, it looks like Andy Leibovitz shot it. This, um, I wanna show you this little video because again, think back to the barrel eye. Here's a chance for scientists to understand how these creatures that they pull up in the nets are actually functioning. And you're gonna see um, on the landers, they would put bait. And so the bait would go down and then for hours and hours, these cameras would film who came by and just led to some really extraordinary discoveries. There were animals a lot deeper than anybody thought they could go. Um, this is a, a, an animal called a cusk eel otherwise known as a robust ass fish. That's the big one that's kind of pointing down here. And then there's a little, you see off to the side, this is called a rat tail, distant cousin of the cod, one of the most common fish in the deep ocean and um, really uh, curious and interesting. Um, there's a mackerel on this bait. And now just watch how the cuskiel addresses this mackerel. Mouth like a vacuum cleaner, not missing anything here. You see the tiny little eye and you saw the big eye on the viper fish. You know, you can have a big eye is metabolically expensive. And in this darkness, this cuskiel, he he's decided evolutionarily speaking that he's not gonna go for the big eyes. He also doesn't have a big brain. He actually has the largest brain to body ratio of any animal in the animal kingdom. 
which would sort of theoretically make him the stupidest animal on earth, but he's doing something right to be able to survive because at this depth, which is about 23,000 feet, there isn't that much competition. He doesn't have any predators. And, um, you know, there are these little crustaceans called amphipods all over the deep ocean. There's tons of them. There is no shortage of amphipods. And um, so the idea that an animal has adapted well enough to have no predators and a pretty constant food source is it's the opposite of dumb. This is another um, photo capture from the lander. And uh, when I got on the ship the first time, I said to the chief scientist, Alan Jameson, what have you guys seen that's like really wild? And he said, well, hmm. Did I tell you about the gelatinous dog's head that was trailing the long tentacles? And I was like, no. So this is a picture of it. Um, you see, it kind of has a canine profile. Uh, this is a stocked ascidian, although it's a species of ascidian that nobody had ever seen before. You can see it's got like, it looks like kind of glowing orbs inside it. And, you know, just... The, the most amazing thing about the landers was you just never knew what was going to swim by or float by or waft by. And um, th another adaptation, this is a close up of um, the, the rat tail. You can see the incredible armoring on his head for the pressures. And uh, their skin is, I got to hold one, their skin is incredibly tough and um, there are many species of them, but you see them a lot. They're they're very curious, and they have they also have really big eyes. They're distant cousins of the cod. And then there were some uh, some some fish that they knew. Uh, this is a lizard called a lizard fish or a bathosaurus, and um, it lives on the abyssal plains. And often when it's seen, it's just sitting there, kind of. And it um, when it strikes. It's an ambush predator. So when it strikes, it moves so fast that it's hard to photograph it. And they just happen to get one uh, swimming, which hardly ever, nobody had ever seen before. And so when, you, when I play this little video clip, just watch how this fish swims, because this is really unusual as well. It's like it levitates. It doesn't move the sediment at all. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful fish. This is the kind of thing that gets scientists really excited when the lander footage comes back. But um, they had always seen it either completely immobile or going so fast they couldn't even photograph it. And here's this beautiful thing just sort of angelically floating away. Oh, now I'm gonna have to talk kind of fast because I'm running out of time a bit. But here we have, so you have all these animals that are at different depths and, and some of them are um, hadal animals like the cuskiel um, and, uh, but fish and amphipods are all over the place. They go all the way down and, and believe it or not, the life doesn't even stop at the seafloor in the deepest parts of the ocean. Um, there's microbial communities that go thousands of feet beneath the seafloor. Um, they call that the, the deep biosphere. And we're just beginning to learn about that. So the, the, the deep ocean, far from being azoic, is absolutely teeming with life, even beneath the seafloor. But fish uh, cannot go all the way down to the bottom of Challenger Deep. The deepest any fish can go is 29,700 feet to date. And this brings us to my favorite animal in the deep ocean, the hadal snailfish. And you'll see these hadal snailfishes here. They're, uh, this was taken, another lander picture. They're, they're there at the mackerels, but they're actually not eating the mackerel. They're there to get the amphipods that come to you eat the mackerel. And if you ever watch time-lapse photography of amphipods eating a mackerel, you will know for a fact that you do not want to be buried at sea. But so these snailfish, and you can see them, they look like they're having the time of their lives, these little cute eyes and these big smiley mouths, and they're, um, they're pink, uh, they're translucent, their bodies almost look like holograms when they swim by, like the bathosaurus, you can sort of see through them. They have a very gelatinous um, encasing around their innards, and they need the pressure to maintain their body form. They have these beautiful sort of fluttery pectoral wings, uh, and they have these long ribbony tails and they are the deepest fish. They uh, are in the hadal zone. They've got it to themselves. No predators eat them. Um, and 
they are so badass. They look like adorable, like little adorable fish. They, it, it just, it kind of cracks me up that here we are in the most hostile environment on earth and the top predator is a pink gummy bear. And so, but the thing about the snailfish is they're, they've adapted so beautifully. Like they don't have any closed cavities in their bodies. Even their skull isn't closed. They don't have a swim bladder, nothing that could be crushed. And um, they, uh, so the, the thing, if, you, if you're made of jello and um, you eat an amphipod, which looks like a little tiny sort of terminator prawn, uh, it will just, one scientist said to me, if you eat an amphipod and you're made of jelly, it will just eat its way out of your head. So the snailfish adapted for that by having two mouths. So the first mouth, which you see here, it sucks in the amphipods like the cuskiel. And the second mouth is, is a set of jaw, pharyngeal jaws right behind the, the first mouth is like a mill, just crushes it into amphipod puree. So you've got this, this, this little pink gummy bear with a, with a mill in its mouth. And um, anyway, I could go on about snailfish. I just think they're so adorable, but we do not get um, fish at the bottom of the uh, Mariana Trench, not below 29,700 feet. And eventually um, uh, evolution will probably catch up to the depth of the ocean. But um, the other thing about a snailfish that is really interesting is that they basically, they have um, like a, um, a chemical called TMAO that acts as scaffolding in their cells um, to hold them open. And uh, they are fully saturated with this chemical and that's why they can't dive any deeper at this particular point in time, but possibly in the future. Um, so I, I'm, I'm moving along a lot faster than I would like to right now, but I did get to dive with Victor to the great depths of the ocean. I don't wanna spoil the book for anybody who may not have read it or um, intends to read it, but it was an extraordinary experience. Um, it was really an honor to be able to share that with readers. Um, that's always my goal when I'm writing is to go into these ocean environments and to enchant readers the way I'm enchanted, but also to take them along with me because this is obviously to date still a very rarefied experience. Um, and it's also was an incredibly spiritual experience um, to be there and to witness it. it I, I had sort of expected this um, because how could it not be? But when you free fall for two and a half hours uh, and you're landing on what is basically a pinprick and you're it, no matter almost without exception there it, the, anywhere you go in the deep ocean you're going to be the first humans to have ever laid eyes on it but also just this this you know it is not space because there's you see that there's so much life the way the water column is alive and you see this it is not, it's not the void of space and there's a presence and there's a pressure and there's a serenity to it, but also like all the beauty, all the serenity, it's, it's also comes with this gravitas. Like this is not a place where humans can even pretend to be in charge. And that was something that really, I loved that, that sense of humility. And there is nothing, nothing that teaches humility like the ocean. You cannot stand in front of a 70 foot wave and think, I'm the man, I've got it here, I'm in charge. And so I, because I happen to think that a lot of our problems come from thinking that we are the overlords of nature, this deep ocean experience will set anybody straight. Um, it's her game, it's her rules. And because of our technology and with the requisite humility and skill, we are privileged enough to be able to witness it, but on her terms. Uh, and that was something that I, you know, just reveled in. Uh, and this is Victor Vescovo, who made all of this exploration possible and is just an incredible character um, who you meet if you read the book. But so we are continuing to learn all kinds of things about the deep ocean. It has so many more mysteries to um, reveal to us. Um, but of course, with increased um, understanding of it and increased um, scrutiny of it and uh, robots and subs and all kinds of things that can enable us to see it and get to know it better um, comes increased threats. Uh, and some of the threats that we're going to be um, dealing with and are dealing with now are 
The Twilight Zone with its quadrillions of tiny fish, you're probably not gonna be shocked to find out that some countries wanna fish it. Um, there's a reason why this is a very bad idea, uh, aside from the fact that we're doing it because we've wiped out all kinds of other fish stocks. But the reason that it's a very bad idea is because the, these Twilight Zone um, creatures uh, do something extraordinary every day. They migrate up the water column hundreds of feet, even maybe a thousand feet, and they hunt sun-nourished phytoplankton in the photic waters, uh, the upper waters of the ocean, and swim back down and they do that every day. It's the, it's the world's largest animal migration. It's a vertical one and it happens every single day. And the most amazing thing is that they're, they're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. They're taking uh, carbon from the, the sun nourished phytoplankton, swimming it down, getting eaten by something, getting excreted, excreting it. And some of that carbon ends up uh, at the very bottom of the seafloor where it's sequestered for um, hundreds of years, even thousands of years. So this is a biological carbon pump, very intricate um, ecology of how, this is the reason, part of the reason at very least, why the ocean can suck down so much of our excess carbon dioxide and heat. Um, so the idea of somehow unraveling the fabric of that life in the twilight zone is of course off the charts stupid. But, um, and, and the other thing is, of course, we wouldn't eat these fish, these twilight zone fish. We would grind them up and, and use them for fish feed for the fish that we're now being forced to feed because we fished like idiots before. So the, this is yet again, bad ideas um, that we will have to uh, hopefully prevent from happening. But I, it's just sort of like a wisdom test and we are gonna have to pass one sometime very soon. Um, another thing that is kind of extraordinary is the amount of um, pollution that there is throughout the ocean, in particular um, nanoparticles and microscopic particles of plastic, um, but all kinds of other stuff, um, radioactive carbon, isotopes, um, lots of dioxins and PCBs and persistent organic pollutants that we outlawed, but they didn't just vanish in a puff of smoke. They're still down there. But I want to draw your attention to one thing that kind of blew my mind. And that was that on um, uh, one of the five deep um, dives uh, in the Mariana Trench, um, they found a new species of amphipod. And um, they, they got this, these amphipods can be quite tiny, although there were also super giant amphipods. This one was a tiny one. And they now what they do when they get a new species is they will genetically sequence it. And they also look under really powerful microscopes. And this particular um, amphipod wasn't fully organic. It had plastic, not just in its gut, but woven into its organs and in its cells. And um, the creature was a hybrid organic plastic creature because at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the plastic is virtually microscopic. And so they went back, they got as many of these amphipods as they could. Um, they could not find one that did not have this plastic. They had no baseline species. It was, they named it Eurothenus plasticus, the first hybrid organic plastic organic creature. And so I said to Alan Jameson, the chief scientist, like, do you think there are, uh, he, he's really the uh, world's foremost expert on the Hadal zone. He said, I, I said, do you think there are other animals down here like this? And he said, all of them. So that's another thing. And, and, you know, if this plastic is so embedded throughout the, you know, so, like suffused throughout even the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the sediments down there, like where else is it? It's, it's this can't be good for anybody. Um, climate change is obviously going to have a huge impact on the deep ocean. It takes a while for the circulation to get down there, but um, about 80% of the earth's microbial uh, biomass is in the ocean. And these microbes sort of regulate the earth. They, they have a lot to do with the geochemistry and biochemistry and oxygen production and all this. And if something tips in the deep ocean and all of a sudden a different microbial regime comes forward under different conditions, different, say a different pH, different temperature, we could end up in a, with a planet that looks very different than the one we live on now that supports life for us. Um, and this is terrifying. Uh, there is always this rare biosphere in the background where it's like um, Earth's DNA archive of things that have happened in the past. 
And if suddenly it becomes very acidic in an environment, a different microbe species will flourish, but they're there. If you imagine a field of grass with a few individual wildflowers in it, those individual wildflowers are the rare biosphere waiting for, you know, cause the ocean's got nothing but time. So um, climate change is uh, kind of a giant question mark, but not likely to be particularly uh, helpful in terms of a lot of things if we would like to continue to thrive here. Um, I'm going to wrap up with this last point and because I want to be able to answer some questions, but the most of all these things, none of them are good. Uh, lots of things freak me out about it, the ocean. Bottom trawling, I cannot figure that one out. Um, industrial fishing, I hate lots of things that we do, but there is nothing, absolutely nothing that has freaked me out as much as the idea of deep sea mining. Uh, and I wrote a chapter in the underworld about this and researched it for a very long time to be able to compress it because it's complicated, it's political, and it is, um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to it, to be able to put it into one narrative chapter so that people who knew nothing about it, which is most people, uh, would get a sense of exactly what was going on. Um, it has not happened yet on an industrial scale, but it's quite imminent and the fight is on now. And what they are talking about doing is mining First, there's three different kinds of deep sea mining at least, but the one they're talking about, if you look at this slide, you see that the seafloor, like it looks like there's these little black, like orbs, balls, little, little uh, nodules, they're called no nodules. These nodules uh, do grow on the seafloor at abyssal depths, um, not everywhere, but in lots of places. Uh, and they, how they grow is they accrete minerals from um, and minerals uh, from the seawater and they grow like a pearl very slowly around a nucleus. So these little tiny things might be 10 million years old. Um, they can be about as big as a, a big orange and they can be as small as a tiny little gumball. They take a really long time to form and they are an ecosystem. Um, they're not like rocks. They're more like trees or corals because they have um, microorganisms living uh, inside them, microorganisms help create them. Um, they're a substrate on the bottom, so lots of animals attached to them. That, uh, the, for the, the mining that is proposed to happen first is the, is the scraping of these nodules off the seafloor across vast, vast areas of, of um, uh, uh, an area called the Clearing Clipperton Zone, which is about 2 million square miles um, between Mexico and Hawaii. And each mine site is 30,000 square miles. So if you can imagine a, a mine site that's 30,000 square miles on land, this is a, will be the largest extractive industry that we have ever pursued. And we are, would be doing it in an environment where we don't know what lives there. Um, it, is way more biodiverse than we know because so much, so much of it is microorganisms. And we also just have seen so little of the area. We don't know what the organisms are doing. We don't know how this ecosystem functions. So this is just like such a, a piece of insanity that hundreds of deep sea scientists have been banded together to basically beg for a moratorium to make sure that this doesn't happen at the very least until we've studied the environment and um, can say with assurance, like, first of all, this is also the world's biggest carbon sink. So um, the irony is that the companies and the individuals that want to do this, uh, I, I'm afraid I don't have time to get into all the explanation of who it is and why, but um, it is, the, the notion is that these, these nodules have cobalt, manganese, and nickel in them, and we can cop a little bit of copper and we could, uh, and a little bit of iron, we could use those to have a greener future because we could make EV batteries from them. You couldn't really make this up, um, that we would disrupt this environment that is probably what's keeping the earth's uh, chemistry in balance and sequestering all of our carbon so we could have a greener future. But um, that is indeed what they're saying. Now, there's many, many, many reasons why this isn't true, what they're saying, that we don't have to do this. And if we did eventually have to do it, believe me, there would be better technologies than they're intending to use. It, imagine clear cutting a forest, but taking the top 20 feet of topsoil. And that's what they're talking about. 
um, it would be irreversible because these nodules will never come back on human time scales. The ecosystem that has grown up around them will never come back. The microbial activity when they mine like this, um, it ends basically, it's, it just ends. Um, so this is what's going on right now. Um, I have resources to find out more and to um, uh, basically uh, speak out about this in, in my book, but um, I'm kind of out of time. Uh, I would love to answer any questions that you have, but I hope this has been a kind of a fun dive. Um, I do think that it is the most exciting subject I've ever written about. And I just think the notion that there is this whole, like most of the planet is still a, a cabin of curiosities and a magnificent mystery is just, it makes me very excited to share it. Thank you so much and love to answer questions. Thank you, Susan. It was just, I feel like we should already schedule you for um, part <laughs> two. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to kind of quickly tick through the uh, the Q&A here uh, if you have some time. And, and a special thanks again, Susan. Uh, I know I know it's getting late your time uh -huh. um, for everyone's benefit. She's on the East Coast. So she's really a trooper for, for doing this so late, uh, so late her time. Um, but yeah, kind of quickly jumping into it. I guess the, the first one is more on you uh, you personally. What's the longest that you've been in, in, a, in a submersible and, and kind of what was your experience uh, as far as like the decompression goes and effects after that? Oh, well, you know, first of all, you don't decompress at all in a submersible because you're at one atmosphere. Um, if anything breaches that sphere, as we saw with the horrible tragedy of the Titan submersible, um, you're done, you're liquid. Um, so there, you're, you're basically at one atmosphere when you get in, they seal the hatch, you go down at one atmosphere, your oxygen is um, in-house in and you come up at one atmosphere. So there is no decompression. And as I said, the deepest, the deep dive that I did with Victor, you know, we free fell for almost three hours. So we were three hours down, about three and a half hours on the bottom and three hours up. So that's about nine and a half hours. Makes sense. And then um, I guess similarly, can you talk about uh, a water temperature and just kind of what it looks like, you know, if, if, if surface is X, like what it looks like at, you know, 5,000, 15,000, yeah. 30,000 feet and, and B, if you feel that inside the submersible. You do, because the submersible, the, the Victor sub um, was made of uh, three inch thick titanium, titanium. So it, you don't have a whole lot between your feet and the titanium and the, the uh, deep, the, the very deep ocean is pretty homogenous in terms of temperature. It's one or two degrees Celsius above freezing. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the sphere starts to chill and, you know, you're, you feel it in your feet and your hands and stuff like that. There's a Makes little sense. bit of so what's the level that you get down to that it's kind of consistent after that? Is it just kind of after the sun stops penetrating or is it? Uh, yeah, is there like I mean, it, it, it probably over uh, it's, and, and I don't know that it's homogenous everywhere in the ocean, um, but at the very bottom, at the depths of the hadal zone, it's it's more it's homogenous, pretty homogenous. There are some sub zero hadal zones. There's one in Antarctica, um, but of course, it doesn't freeze, but it's it's uh, sub zero, very close to freezing. Makes sense. Um, and then so was, we had a question, what was the weirdest uh, chemiosynthesis interaction that you that you observed? Um, I was on uh, one of the um, expeditions that I was on, we had an ROV that uh, was on um, uh, a bunch of uh, black, what they call black smoker hydrothermal vents um, on the Juan de Fuca Ridge, which is off the coast of uh, Washington, British Columbia. There's a really active, um, spreading zone there where the plates are pulling apart and um, a very dominant, vibrant volcanic vent scene there. And we were on one vent where there were just a million different kinds of worms. And these worms are super unusual. They have microbes inside their bodies and the microbes digest all these sort of would, would be to most animals toxic chemicals and turn it into energy and then share it with the, share it with the worms. So there's like a sort of a symbiotic relationship going on and um there are sort of little crabs running around these some of these uh, black smoke or hydrothermal vents are are like 400 and 500 degrees the 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 um emissions that are coming out of them the vent fluid so you see these animals running around in this 500 degree fluid and it's just kind of mind-blowing that's pretty wild that's a, yeah. that's awesome um, and so do, do those microbes um, in general typically bioluminesce like a lot of the fish do, or is that more uh, more rare? They do, but not, I mean, there's 
I don't know how many kinds of microbes there are, trillions, I don't know. But there are definitely lots of bioluminescent microbes. Um, and you see them when you're um, descending in the plexiglass hold sub and they're kind of, you know, they, they when you go through the twilight zone, it's like there is everything's just kind of sparkling and twinkling over here, over here, over here. So yeah, and a lot of them are pretty uh, either microbial or microorganisms, quite really small creatures. Makes sense. Um, and then so the, 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 the photo of the lost city uh, was incredible. Um, do you see those kind of along all of the fault subduction zones um, or like, like if, if you're like kind of on, on, you know, the volcanic vents off of like Big Sur and Monterey Canyon, like I, I, would you see similar stuff down there or is that kind of unique to that place as far as we know? It, so Lost City, we only have ever found one site like Lost City. And but they're, they're the reason that they think there are other Lost Cities. It's not um, uh, it's not a a sulfide vent. It's not the, the, a lot of the volcanic vents like black smokers and white smokers are very hot and are um, spewing out a sort of a mix that includes a lot of minerals and they, it really looks like smoke and it and the lost city is um, the vent is the vent fluid is clear. It's warm. It's not hot and it's alkaline, not acidic. Like it's very, very different and it's not volcanic. It's the, what's really unusual about Lost City is that it actually is formed when a piece of the mantle, the, so the mantle is made out of um, like, um, a, a mineral called serpent, ser, serpentinite. And when it hits sea, when serpentinite hits seawater, like this particular Lost City is on a fracture zone. So some mantle rock got pushed up and when it hits seawater, it, the, um, there's a chemical reaction that creates these carbonate towers. So the towers of Lost City are like almost like limestone in caves. And that's really unusual. And it's not volcanically created. It's created in the process of serpentinization when this serpentinite mineral hits the seawater. Um, they would love to find more Lost Cities um, because so there's, a, there's a, of course, this ongoing debate of, okay, so how did life actually start on this planet? And I don't know if we'll ever definitively be able to prove one hypothesis over another, but there are a lot of people who think that hydrothermal vents are the leading candidate, but there were some issues with them. And among the issues are that they're volcanic, so they can get smothered and they might not have the kind of durability to get life going. Well, Lost City has all of it. It has all the chemistry. It's much more long lived. And so that's why all these astrobiologists want to go there because we're now wondering, what about the other ocean worlds in our solar system? What about the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, like Enceladus and Europa? And like, they have oceans and they may have at least, at very least microbial life in those oceans. So they are studying Lost City in, to, in order to be able to understand what they might find on these other places. But it's a really unique situation to, to date. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, so one one more serious one, and then one fun one, and then we'll we'll let you go. So the more serious one, uh, do you know why they're choosing the the area that you mentioned for the potential mining site? Um, that kind of seems to be, you know, that's that's a, a big like migration path for a lot of whales and a lot of you know different different creatures kind of migrating oh, yeah. between Baja and, and it's Hawaii. Gonna be, yep, it's going to be devastating for cetaceans um, because the noise is going to be twenty four seven, and also the creatures. Oh, and I should also add. They found when, so the Clarion Clipperton zone turns out is a biodiversity hotspot in the deep ocean. And the reason it was chosen is because there are a lot of nodules there and it's on the high seas and the 54% of the planet or 51 or it's, it's a little bit more than half that is um, waters beyond national jurisdiction is uh, overseen by the International Seabed Authority, which is a group that was created under out of the UN um, when they wrote the treaty of the law of the sea. So this. International Seabed Authority is the one that's divvying up all these parts of the deep ocean and setting rules to do it. And frankly, encouraging the development of this as an industry. Um, and this clearing Clipperton zone was chosen just because it's compared to the other types of deep sea mining, which include like grinding up hydrothermal vents and scalping the tops off seamounts. This is considered to be what the public might swallow is this dredging of these nodules. Um, so there's 19 of these 30,000 square mile mines in the Clarion Clipperton zone that have already been spoken for. Um, there could be more, uh, 
but in any case, scientists have been racing out there to try to figure out what's going to be destroyed. And 92% and of these species that they bring up are new species, animals we've never seen before. And in fact, lots of creatures that don't even like have genera, they're just like new branches on the tree of life. Um, so the, the, the notion that this was chosen because it's just an area that nobody cares about, it's going to have profound effects on any animals around. The deep ocean, the animals are not adapted to hearing like rattling sounds. It's the stablest environment on earth. Um, lights vibrate, there's gonna to be tons of vibration because keep in mind, once they get all this stuff, they're gonna be shooting up a three and a half mile pipe. So that pipe is gonna be rattling throughout the entire water column. And then they're gonna to have to take the nodules out and spray all the rest of the debris, which is by the way, animal and mineral, because anything that's living on these nodules is going up that pipe. And by the time it gets sprayed back out, they're planning to do it at 12,000 meters which puts it into the twilight zone. And all of these waters are crystal clear. So all of a sudden, all these animals that we're hunting and mating and using bioluminescence to communicate are in a smog, a, a perpetual smog. And I mean, it's just, it really is, like I can barely talk about it without completely going off the deep end. I've cried in public talking about it. I cannot believe that we're gonna do this. I cannot believe that we'd be that insane. Yeah, it's it's pretty horrific, but ho hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep you from crying. We have well, one more fun one before uh, before we go. Um, so, if you like magic wand test, if there was, uh, if you could kind of do a, a submersible expedition, you know, unlimited budget, whatever you want, what would be your what's your dream kind of magic wand expedition? Gosh, well, you know, um, I I have to say that I really would like to see Lost City. It's really hard to get to it because it's right in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. But that is um, something that I am laser focused on. It's very doable because it's only 1800 feet deep. So that the translucent hold submersibles could go there. I just need a boat and a crew and a, probably half a million bucks. But if we we're going on an expedition, I would probably see Antarctica because the, the amount of life in those really cold productive waters in Antarctica from everything I've heard is just like off the charts crazy and hardly anybody has ever gone down there to look around and you have just the magnificence of i i don't know all the and i guess it probably isn't a surprise that i would pick a fully aquatic environment but yeah probably antarctica makes sense well thank you so much and uh, we did have thank one you. more just kind of come in is there anything that you know we can do as far as like activism or or you know anyone we get in touch with to to help prevent um deep sea mining yeah so i um the easiest thing i can do is point you to the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Um, it's in, um, a group that is uh, like the NRDC and that they have a lot of lawyers and this is lawyers are called for here. Um, their website is savethehighseas.org and they, um, the, the ISA, the International Seabed Authority tries to do everything behind closed doors, very antithetical to journalism and observation and it really like um, inquiry. Um, and uh, so the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition has a seat at the table and reports on everything that they're doing. And um, the US, believe it or not, is not a player in this because we didn't ratify the Treaty of the Law of the Sea. So it's not America who's leading this charge. It's a lot of, it's, believe it or not, Norway. And China is, of course, right there wanting to dive in. And um, a lot of so smaller South Pacific nations, are, the South Pacific nations are kind of divided between understanding that this is just treacherous and uh and and being desperate economically and creating uh consort uh partnerships with um commercial mining companies that really want to get at the seafloor so um yeah like i said it's complicated and political and i've written about it but save the high seas.org will give you all kinds of information fact sheets um keep you up to date on the news and there lately has been some talk about there are some people in the U.S. government that want to uh, mine within U.S. territorial waters, which, of course, any country could do like tomorrow. They don't need permission from the International Seabed Authority. So um, what I at this point, it's a little tough because all I can say is make yourself aware and keep on top of it. Um, but it's something that is kind of happening out of sight. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're the best organization and it's the most actionable thing I can think of to tell you.
Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, and yeah, you have a, a good a good group of participants here that I'm sure will be very vocal about it. So uh, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, Susan, I don't know, or Susan H., I don't know if you have anything else. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I actually think that this is such a critical issue that, um, you know, I'd love to be in touch, Susan, and maybe we can target something, um, I don't know, later in the year or next year or something where we could have a panel discussion or something to get the word out. Oh yeah, so now I, I actually wound off one of my topics, but what I want, one thing I wanted to say about the clearing Clipperton zone is they found all these divots down there. So then they look and they find they find all kinds of crazy fossilized things. They think these divots in the sea in the sediment have been made by beak, beaked whales in the ancient past, and they found um, all kinds of um, whale um, fossilized whale. Um, skulls and bones and things like that because um the manganese the process that creates the manganese nodules also uh, sort of coats them with metals and minerals as well so these are like major fossil beds um particularly for cetaceans so anyway yeah they yeah. find megalodon teeth encrusted in metals and i mean that the area has not been touched before okay well yeah. uh just just fantastic. So thank you again so much. And again, um, let's continue that conversation on the protecting um, the seas, the ocean floors. So thank you so much. Really thank a pleasure. You. Yeah. Have a see everyone in um, in April, where our uh, speaker we're going is Sarah Allen on elephant seals. So all right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Susan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.